sorry, I forgot to put this to record. So now again, <laughs> thanks to Rachel and everybody for being here with us. Uh, we met uh, Rachel three years ago when she came to Porto to teach us um, about uh, retouching on modern and contemporary paintings. And uh, since then, our world changed a little because she introduced us to a, a new a world of new techniques and materials uh, on retouching. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, But today we are not going to talk uh, about that. We can, but uh, the focus is uh, because we want to know a little about the big change that Rachel um, performed in her life because she, she, she changed uh, her career. Uh, after working on Tate for 20 years, she decided to go uh, into private practice and we want to know uh, a little more about that. So Rachel, uh, the word goes to you. Can, you. can you introduce yourself a little, please? So first of all, can you hear me? Yes. Everybody can hear me, okay. I don't think these are helping me at all, so I'm gonna take them off, okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, I'm Rachel and I'm an accredited painting conservator and specializing in modern and contemporary paintings. Um, and um, I'm currently in private practice. Um, my um, practice is um, uh, based in central London. Um, that sounds very grand. Um, I don't have a studio. Um, I'm currently working in an office in central London and also out of my home, which is just outside of London. And uh, yeah, so um, in November 2018, I um, left Tate after 20 years. So yeah, as Marta says, it was a, a very, very big change in my circumstances. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to meet you all today and to give you some idea about what that change consisted of and how I went about it. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm very glad to be able to share it with you because I've had lots and lots of people contacting me and saying, oh my God, I can't believe that you've done that. You must be out of your mind, you know, but... Um, you know, it's a very different world um, and I miss so many things I cannot tell you, but I'm also um, just totally loving my freedom and loving the people that I'm meeting and the challenges that I've now got, which are different challenges, but nonetheless, they are challenges and they are for me, new challenges. So, um, we are living in these uh, different times now. Uh, can you work? Can you do your work? Well, I have plenty of work in that I have two children at home, but um, regardless of that, um, I am, um, you know what I think, even when we, we don't have um, specific projects to work on, um, you know, I have so much reading to do. I'm so behind in, in Reading, I mean, one of the things that, you know, obviously working in a museum environment, which had a sort of research aspect to it, is I had the opportunity to um, be constantly learning all the time. And it's very, you know, it's quite tempting when you leave that environment to think that that's no longer important. And of course, keeping up to date with research is, 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 is fundamentally important to me. And it's very much tied in with my sense of, um, uh, being a, a dignified conservator, you know, so I kind of feel um, in order to sort of justify myself now, I've got to be as um, up to date with research and literature as I, as I possibly can be, even more so now because I don't have my lovely colleagues saying, oh, have you read Stephen Hackney's new book on, on the canvas? And, you know, and have you read Pia Gottschaller's amazing book on uh, Blinky Palermo? So now I've got to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm keeping up, up, up to date myself. And it's, I think it's really important. And it really gives me a lot of self-respect. If I've read a paper, I think, ha, huh, I may be a private conservator, but I'm just <laughs> clever as everybody else. So I think that's one, one major thing that I've taken away from, from the museum. I, and I'm sorry, that, that sounds terrible. And I know all you private conservators out there are just as informed as any museum conservator. But, you know, I'm, I'm learning how, how to balance everything now. So and that's definitely one thing that I'm... So I have got 
huge number of books sitting on that bookshelf over there just <laughs> screaming at me to be opened. So, so yes, I feel I am working. Yeah, yeah that, that's true. That's a, a different type of work. So <laughs> you can do it. So yeah. I will ask some people, some, some questions that uh, the participants sent to us. Okay. Yeah. Some, of, some of them you have already answered, so you, okay. you can manage it. So um, what age uh, did you start working at Tate? Was it your first job? No, so before I went to Tate, I worked for 10 years in uh, regional museums um, um, as, a, as a generalist conservator, so working on historical paintings and modern and contemporary. Um, and I think it was in the second of those jobs when I was the painting conservator for Southampton City Art Gallery that I was, um, uh, I found myself responsible for a number of very challenging contemporary artworks, particularly sculpture. So I had things like Anthony Gormley lead pieces that were beginning to form white excrescences all over the surface. And I was working with Anya Galaccio flower pieces. And these were not paintings, you know, I come from a pure painting background and suddenly I was having to think of ways in which to treat um, oxidizing lead and um, wilting flowers. And we also had this um, beautiful Shirazo Hushiari um, fountain, which um, I had to keep filling up with a certain amount of water and, um, uh, uh, um, and pigments um, each day. And, you know, I, I suddenly felt, oh my, I'm, 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 an, I'm not a conservator, I'm like an artist here. And that sort of sense of working, having to get inside the head of an artist so that whatever I did absolutely represented what they were trying to communicate in these objects. I found that really challenging and an incredible intervention. And I kind of, that's when I started to think I should be talking to artists. I should, my work should be much more involving living artists and not thinking maybe I should do that or perhaps that would be good enough, but actually going to the source of the object and asking them instead. So that then, uh, that then led me to apply for um, a Winston Churchill scholarship um, to go and work um, purely on contemporary art conservation at the National Gallery of Canada. And so I spent a year um, in uh, Ottawa working with an, a very dynamic um, uh, um, Quebecois conservator called Richard Gagné. And that was it. I was off. He was so incredibly inspiring to me. He had me conserving pin cushions and um, uh, uh, he, was, he was challenging me every single day of the week and he was getting me to invent um, all sorts of conservation processes and pair, peel objects back to their kind of um, basic components and, and start to think of, of how these objects, these materials interacted with each other and um, and um, that was it. I was completely hooked on treating modern and contemporary art and all the challenges that came with it. And then I was incredibly lucky because that year was 1999 and Tate Modern were recruiting uh, three conservators who had specialist knowledge in modern and contemporary painting conservation. So I was very, very lucky to join um, uh, wonderful conservators like Annette King and Patricia Smithen and Tim Green. And we formed a foursome that um, um, were responsible for the inauguration of the painting displays at, at Tate Modern in um, the year 2001. It yeah. sounds amazing and uh, it leads me to the following question that is, was it a dream job? Um, at least for uh, most of the people listening to this uh, chat, I can assume it was. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to tell you, I did not walk into a job at Tate. I had tried to get a job at Tate so many times. So it was my dream to always work at the Tate. I had had... Uh, I had literally, uh, I had four interviews at Tate in 10 years and I, every time I went, I got more and more desperate and more and more pleading. So in fact, the reason I went to Canada was to try and consolidate my portfolio because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I had this incredible passion, which I think they all thought was just a little bit quaint, but actually had very little substance to it. So I think, you know, by going off to Canada, 
actually carrying out some fairly scary conservation treatments um, that I was able to come back and say, right, okay, okay, I know I'm slightly hysterical, but I've actually got some treatments under my belt now that you cannot surely uh, deny me this uh, opportunity. And, and in 1999, they finally, they finally agreed um, <laughs> to, to give me a job. So it, it, it was, you know, I, I always envy these people who managed to come straight out of college and walk into their, you know, these big institutions. Well, it wasn't me. I did 10 years service in regional galleries. You had to so work it. My bread and butter, definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. It. And so I, I can assume it was really a, a big and difficult decision um, to quit. Yeah, it was a massive decision to quit and it always will be. And every single day I wake up and I, there's a kind of, you know, I have to swallow hard to kind of remember that I don't have the Tate, behind, you know, uh, I'm not in the Tate family anymore. But you know what, I, I had, 20 incredible years at Tate. Um, uh, I got to work on the most extraordinary paintings. I worked on an Agnes Martin, I worked on a Rothko, I worked on a, a Lichtenstein, I worked on a Yenis Kunelis, I worked on a Rosenquist, you know, um, to name like the, the guys that we'll all have heard of. And all the, all these incredible opportunities I had working with you know, contemporary living artists who would come into the Tate and I'd be part of a team, uh, part of a dialogue about how best to, you know, uh, care for these um, objects, many of which had ephemeral elements to them. Some of them very temporal pieces like Richard Long's mud paintings. You know, I, I had, you know, these extraordinary opportunities. And I can tell you, it's a lot easier to ring up a gallery and say, hey, I'm Rachel Barker at Tate Gallery. Please, can I speak to Richard Long than it is to yeah. ring up and go, hey, I'm Rachel Barker. I'm a small, tiny little um, private conservator working in London who you won't have heard of, but could I possibly speak to Richard Long? So, I mean, I knew that, you know, the Tate opened a huge number of doors and gave me a huge number of opportunities. But I'll tell you something. And I mean, there's lots and lots of reasons why I left the Tate. Um, but I do have this very strong memory of one day over the summer in, 19, in 2018, sitting at my desk and looking at my colleagues, my younger colleagues like uh, Anna Cooper, uh, Harriet Pearson, so the, the younger generation of modern and contemporary uh, of conservators who have strong interests in modern and contemporary. And I just looked at the energy. I mean, these people were skipping off to uh, take dust off Ellsworth Kelly's. And Annette and I would sit there and go, will you clean the Ellsworth Kelly today? And she'd go, no, I don't want to clean it. And I'd go, well, I don't want to clean it. I cleaned it last week. And she'd go, well, I cleaned it the week before that. And then you would have these younger people going, Ellsworth Kelly, oh my God, I can't believe I'm getting to clean an Ellsworth Kelly. And I suddenly thought, you know what? It's definitely time to move on a little you know I what you know I was I'd had I'd had my chances I'd had my opportunities I'd got to do some amazing things and the fact that I was the idea of of going and dusting an Ellsworth Kelly at 8 30 in the morning in Tate Modern was slightly <clears throat> it was definitely time to go you know I mean who who in their right mind is going to turn up you know, the chance of cleaning an Ellsworth Kelly. So, you know, I, I thought, you know, it's time for me to have a new challenge, I think, and it's time for me to move aside and accept that um, there are other people here who are gonna have the, the thrill of, of cleaning these things that I had 20 years ago, but maybe mm -hmm. I've become a little blase about it now and, and it's time, yeah, it's time to move on to postures new. So can you tell me, can, can you tell us a little about Rachel Barker Associates? What do you do? What type of organization is it? How many people work with you? <laughs> well, it sounds incredibly grand, doesn't it? Um, Associates. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, how did it come about? Well, let me let me go back a little bit. So, in the last, I would say, the last five or six years I was at Tate, um, I, apart from uh, times when I was involved in um, big projects um, involving whole teams of people, like with the Rothko Project and WAM, where I was having to work full-time, I was working part-time. 
um, in between those big projects. And in the other part of the week, when I wasn't at Tate, I was doing either teaching or I was doing um, some private work for, for um, uh, a number of uh, galleries. And um, I found that I really loved teaching. Um, I mean, Marta, you gave me an opportunity to come and teach for 2021. I've been doing some, I, I noticed a few, I recognize quite a few faces. Joanna, hello, for, for, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, from both 2021 and other courses I've taught. And I just began to think, you know, this is something I'd really like to do more of. So one side of me now is doing a bit of teaching, albeit more, as a sort of continued professional development type teaching like I'm, I have very small things I can teach about like uh, the retouching of modern paint surfaces um, which is a course that I do a three-day course and I've done a little bit of a little bit of teaching on na nano gels as well um, but so that's one side of what I do now and the other side is obviously I have to earn um, a, a bit more of a living and when in 2018 I was conserving WAM, I met a, an academic writer and artist um, who um, I um, did some work with and we realized that we worked quite well together and he, um, I found working with, a, with an actual um, artist incredibly interesting and inspiring and he's someone who, he's a very tricky man, he challenges me all the time he's he's very anti a number of conservation processes like he'll say things to me like if if you re he's a bit like ad reinhardt he says if you retouch my painting it's it's your painting you know kind of thing which so we argue the toss constantly <laughs> about the things but i found i was getting really really excited and, and beginning to think about new things so i said to him look i've got to do a bunch of condition reports will you come along and um whilst I'm looking at the painting, can you make notes on your computer? And it worked really, really well because it gave me the chance to just stand in front of the object and focus entirely on what I was looking at and not have to look and then turn away and write it down and then look again and turn away and write it down. He was doing all the note taking, I was doing all the looking and what we produced was really quite something. And he started adding bits of art history because he's a trained art historian and we found our clients really liked uh, a bit of art history it gave the paint the object that they were potentially going to purchase or the object that they were concerned about from their collection a little context and we found we had a formula that worked quite well so um when i thought that maybe it might be time to hang up my paintbrushes and move on from tate i asked him if he might think about trying to see if we could go freelance and that's how it's working out at the moment mm -hmm. um, so um, he um, also has a, a background in finance management so he very much deals with um, the um, business management side of RBA and I obviously that then frees me up to really deal purely with the objects so now you don't uh, do conservation it's more uh, my work console so, I mean, as you all, as those of you who are in private practice know, it costs a huge amount of money to set up a studio. And um, I can't say it won't ever happen, but certainly at the moment, I'd, I don't have the financial means to set up a, a fully mm -hmm. operational conservation studio in the way I feel I would, I would want to do it. So um, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm doing on-site work. Um, so I've done a little bit of on-site work. Um, but I also am aware that there are some spectacular um, specialists in London working on modern and contemporary painting and many of them are actually my friends. Mm -hmm. So it's a complicated one because on, in some ways I don't want to step on their, their toes, but at the same time I want to be, up, I want to be in business alongside them. So I am looking more at kind of gaps in, in perhaps the market that I can fill in other ways. I also, I've all, I'm very lucky in that in the, in the years I was at Tate, I, I made relationships with some quite high level collectors working um, in uh, the USA and in Europe and Asia. And so those people have continued to um, ask me to work for them. I have one particular collector 
who employs me to manage their uh, museum quality collection, uh, which is very challenging. It's in a, it's in a museum, it's in, it's in a marine environment um, in Europe. And um, uh, there, the, these objects um, uh, repeatedly get infected by mold due to the climate. There is no climate control in the building the works are stored in. So um, a lot of the work I was doing last year was a very bespoke um, collection care package for a very particular challenging environment involving the design of um, uh, climate control vitrines in which to put <laughs> paintings such as um, Ellsworth Kelly, uh, Lichtenstein's, um, de Corning paintings, Buri paintings, things that are spectacularly sensitive to high levels of humidity um, and trying to sort of squirrel them away into these optium vitrines um, and um, keep them, uh, stop their deterioration. So that's taken up a huge amount of my time. That seems and, a very challenging uh, yeah. work. It has been quite challenging. Um, and um, I've, yeah, and I've, I've mostly had, I think I've been very lucky. Um, I've, I've, I've met some incredible people and I've, I'm learning so much being out uh, in the field and kind of having to take responsibility for, for the decisions I make without having the sort of cloak of, of, of a major institution behind me. Do you feel you work more now or when you were in states? work more uh uh no um i would love to tell you that i'm you know i i'm working constantly but i you know i'm you know i haven't got work all the time um mm -hmm. it's you know i i do have periods where i am very reflective and i think oh my god what have i done you know um but then you know just as things get bad i get a phone call from a collector in america wanting me to go and look at some amazing painting and you go there? and I'll go yeah I've done yeah I have but also I mean I've, I've had quite I'm lucky in that I've had quite a lot of teaching too so I did and I was very lucky to be invited to um, co-curate a seminar on Liechtenstein's um, practice at, at the Whitney last June so I've had sort of some rollover things that were established when I was still working at the Tate. Um, and um, I, 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 I'm still, I, I, I had a lot of teaching planned for this year, but obviously due to COVID, um, that's yeah. all had to be um, canceled. So um, mainly, although um, I can see a colleague of mine, Pia Gottschaller smiling, a very familiar face i'm going to be doing a little bit of online teaching for the court hold oh, okay. so you know that's maybe something i'm doing some teaching for sral uh, the okay. atelier Lindberg in mm -hmm. Maastricht, and we're maybe going to discuss whether or not that can be done online so okay there's a few things in the pipeline but i'm very much on gardening leave at the moment you know it's also good. like an out of work actor <laughs> And, yeah. and it's uh, what's what was your biggest challenge till now since you moved uh, to your company? Okay, the biggest challenge is that museum near the port. No, the, no, I would say no. You know the um, the it, it, sorry, that's not a museum. It's a private it's a collection. Ah, okay. Yeah, um, but um, I mean that was challenging, but um, it's kind of. The kind of challenge that I really enjoy. I'm thinking about a challenge that I really didn't enjoy was I recently did a, a very large um, job for a gallery in London um, uh, and it was quite a challenging, it was quite a demanding job in so much as I had to clean, uh, take mold off 77 paintings in a very short period of time um, and um, I, it was a rather unorthodox, um, uh, I mean, that's something, you know, I, I'm used to kind of pe curators listening to me and going, oh yeah, well, if you want to do that, then that's fine. Then, you know, whatever. And, you know, when you're working privately, you have to kind of really sell 
uh, yeah. uh, um, what I would call a, uh, a museum standard treatment uh, to someone who's really just after making quite a bit of money. So they want the objects looking as best they can, don't they? Because they want to sell them. And I might be saying, oh, no, 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 that's terribly unethical and you can't possibly do that. So, you know, I've had to kind of take a bit of a back step on my old ethics and sort of swallow my pride and sort of do a few things that maybe I, I would have not wanted to do when I was working in museums. But even so, I've done this big job and I felt I did it to the best of my ability. And then we were told that we wouldn't be paid a penny. So not only was I okay. then liable to pay subcontracted staff who'd come in to help me, but um, and also I'd had to buy um, a, quite a lot of equipment in order to m enable me to do the job properly. Um, they, as a result of um, the lockdown uh, in, uh, and our lawyers and um, accountants have checked the people over and it's not because they're not um, financially fluid. There's no problem with their finances. They're just using the opportunity not to pay. Not to pay. And, and I don't think we'll ever rec recoup our losses. So that's been a major learning curve for me. Yeah, okay. a major learning curve because I'm very trusting. Yeah, yeah I, 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 we, had, we have some situations like that too. Um, yeah. And it's really hard when you work uh, for you for yourself, and uh, just um, yeah. Th does it correspond to you this change? What you thought it would be when you started? Um. So, do you mean uh, has the has it turned out to be what I hoped it might be yeah. working privately? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think. Um, do you regret? No. Do I regret leaving Tate? Uh, no, I don't regret it. Um, I miss things about it. I miss my colleagues because for 20 years, those, those people were like my family. Um, it was like a marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, we hated each other and loved each other. We squabbled like, you know, Annette and I were like, we called each other our conservation husband and wife, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm, I really miss my colleagues. Um, I really don't miss uh the um politics um i um yeah <laughs> um i think museums are tricky um institutions and um i think that um conservators are extraordinarily talented people who who are very very rarely adequately recognized for their um skills um in in museums and yeah i think th there comes a point where whether it's um yeah i think i think you know you you kind of grow out of it really maybe you grow out of accepting that you've worked 14 hours a day on installing an exhibition and then you don't get invited to the private view you know um mm -hmm. you know i i think uh, that sounds so petty but i think it kind of wears you down after a while and you start to think well you know i'd like to have a little more dignity and and i'd you know i i I'd just like to feel i'd like to find myself again in a different context so i think that's definitely what what i've done but yes i miss it terribly and my god i miss the collection <laughs> And it's, you know, it's really, it's really um, difficult because I went in to teach some Courtauld students um, a couple of months ago. I went, I gave them a tour of the galleries and some of the paintings that I was very familiar with and some of the paintings I'd done conservation treatments on. And I, you know, I'm used to kind of being able to step over the barrier and sort of, you know, have a very kind of tactile relationship with these objects. And suddenly I'm just, you know, I kind of went too close and the buzzer went off and the guard came flying around yeah. and I couldn't say, it's okay, I'm a doctor. You know, I had, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just one of the, the, the Joe Average member of the public and, and I can't go near these objects anymore. And yet it's like sort of saying you can't touch your own children, you know, so um, that's really hard. Yeah. But then I've got really into Instagram and I think one of the things that you are, you wanted me to um, answer was um, uh, like how to, how to chat, how to continue rate, keep your interests going and um, what things you can do online and stuff. And I'm, I'm learning so much from Instagram and 
paintings that I've worked on are popping up on Instagram in the weirdest context. And I cannot <laughs> help myself but go, well, I don't like to brag, but actually in 2006, I restored that painting. And da -da -da. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, it's, I'm kind of, I've, I'm kind of in, I've become part of another community. And actually the art world is an extraordinary community and there's so many exciting things happening both online, like um, I wake up in the morning and I have my coffee and I go on Instagram and there's often a, a tour, a virtual tour, like the Pace, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're, uh, if you follow art galleries like Pace Gallery, uh, Stru Ma 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 I'm so sorry to my German, uh, <laughs> Beth, so I, my pronunciation is appalling, but you know, um, um, a lot of the galleries, you can go in and do these amazing tours, which means I don't have to spend £20 on my train ticket to get to mm -hmm. London. You know, I can sit in the comfort of my own study and, 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 and walk around these galleries. So that's, that's something I'm doing a lot of. And I would like to do a plug for people like um, um, uh, Levy Gorvey, um, uh, Dominic Levy um, and Brett Gorvey. Um, uh, they they show paintings and they zoom right into the paintings look, and look at and give you an opportunity to look at these surfaces as if you're a conservator doing a condition report. Wow. I get very very excited by that. So those are those are things you can learn so much um, on online. But I think also. Um, Oh God, I was talking, in fact, I was having a conversation with Pia Gottschaller earlier, so I'm going to be repeating myself, but I, I hate this, I hate this kind of mantra we're all getting about, you know, this is time to reflect. I really don't want to reflect. I've done enough <laughs> reflecting. I want to look forward, move forward. Yeah. You know? And um, I, I, I'm, I want to look at new things now. I want to, I want to challenge myself and, and um, I just want to keep looking. I just want to keep having opportunities to look. And I was running out of those opportunities, I think, at Tate. And I was starting to, my eyesight was going a little, both metaphorically and, 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 and literally. I've, I haven't got my glasses on, but um, <laughs> so I think now I'm, get, I'm gaining new eyes, definitely. Uh, and I would say I'm, being, I'm exposing myself to a lot more um, art through going to galleries and um, things like that. But the other thing I'm doing is going into people's homes and seeing what people have got in their, in their own collections, which on one hand, because I'm a devout socialist, on one hand, it makes me really cross that these people have these amazing objects that should be in museums. But on the other hand, <laughs> Big you know, privilege. Yeah, I, I sort of leave, I have to, to an extent, leave my socialist principles at their front door. And, you know, <laughs> Rachel, I have to thank you very much for your talk. It was really good and uh, we are running out of time. Yeah. So thank okay. you very much. You're and, very, uh, very welcome. And if anybody has any further burning questions, I'm sure they can ask you and you can ask me through email. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. it. So, uh, that's what I was going to suggest, but not without uh, asking you first. No, yeah, that's, that's so, absolutely fine. If, and I want to say, stay safe to everybody. Please look after yourselves. And, yeah. um, um, I, and I hope we all get through this. We yeah. will. If you want to say, turn on your video so we can say goodbye to everyone, we have, I'd like to thank you all. We have people from Portugal, Spain, wow. Italy, Amazing. Brazil, USA, oh Germany, Netherlands, <laughs> Croatia. Oh so thank you very much. We will have I'm so another... glad I put lipstick on. I'm so <laughs> glad I put lipstick on. <laughs> uh, we will have another talk next Friday with a scientist, uh, Brazilian scientist, Virginia Costa. I will send you an email to you all uh, next week. So many thanks to you and uh, keep safe and uh, we will see each other next week. Bye bye Thank Rachel. You. Thank you so Take much. Take care. Look after yourselves. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye.